Okay, welcome to the tutorial about using projections in Maya and baking projections onto the geometry. This is a technique that you can use when you have people that are not used to Maya and you need artists to start doing texture maps for characters. Now this is a slightly more complex um, method in Maya to uh, texture, so you need to have more than just a passing understanding of Maya. This is a little higher uh, level stuff, but I, I will go through this sort of one step at a time so that people can follow along. So if you create a polygon primitive, a sphere, you read it in. Usually in Maya you have your uh, hyper shader that can color it. In this particular instance though, we're going to be actually creating a shader and then instead of simply coloring it, you create a Lambert shader, but instead of just um, applying the color, I like to sort of give this a very quick garish color so that when you put on the object, it's very obvious that it's there. You do that, or you can grab this, right click, assign material solution. Instead of just using this color, we're actually going to be giving sort of a midwife process between the texture map and the uh, the shader itself. So here I have created a shader and now I'm going to go into the color swatch and click on this little checkerboard here which gives the create render node options. And this is where things start getting a little new. So instead of using anything that's readily available here I'm going to come up and I'm going to type in projection. And I don't see anything because I'm not in the right area. This is selecting 2D textures on down to other textures. I actually want the utility nodes. This pops up here. Um, you can actually, uh, this is kind of like a keyword search here. You got the same thing in the outliner. If you leave this blank, you have all the options for whatever you select here in the uh, Create Render Node window. However, because this is uh, Maya 2000, my particular version of Maya that I'm using right now, Maya 2016 may not match exactly other people's versions of Maya. I want to show them different ways that they can find the projection node. So if I come down here and just sort of scroll down to, the, to near the bottom here, I've got the projection node. However, if yours is in another location, you just want to type in projection and it will only show the options that match your keywords that you've typed in, or P-R-O-J or P-R-O, things like that. So in this case, it's good to type this in, um, use your projection node, you can double click that, and it gives this a projection node, which is what we're looking for. Again, this is going to be a projection shader. And I'm trying to show these two things simultaneously in my limited screen space. Now this, uh, at this stage, it's crucial that you understand the way that the shader is set up. If you click off the shader right now and you get none of these options, you want to come in and click, your, uh, click back on this shader and um, follow it down the rabbit hole you've already given it. You can see here that you've got this little arrow with a square at the end of color. Uh, if you do not assign something to a shader in Maya, it retains this kind of checkerboard square, which means nothing has been assigned to it. And if it has an arrow, it means something has been assigned. We have just assigned a utility node for projection. So you simply, if you make a mistake and you click off of this, and you don't know what stage you're at, click on the shader and come down to color and follow it down that arrow. Now again, we're at a very crucial stage, and I want to explain why it is imperative that you first adhere the shader to your object, because we're now going to fit it to the bounding box, which means you are asking Maya to automatically size the projection node to the object. And it knows how to do that because you've already assigned the shader to it. If we hadn't assigned the shader to it, if it was still, a, say, a Lambert color or whatever, the default Lambert shader or some other shader, if we click fit to bit bounding box here, uh, it has no idea what it is you're talking about because it's not been assigned to an object, so it doesn't have an object's proportions to size the shader to. So making sure that this is on your object is crucial before you start using these. So when I click on fit to bounding box, take a look at what's going to happen here over in the left. When I click on that, it's going to ask me to create a placement node. When I say yes, please it then throws this projection up. Now this is 
Uh, very important to understand how Maya is setting this up. This is effectively the screen to the slide to the uh, slide projector, so that when it projects the texture onto the sphere, it's going to do so as if it was one of those old timey slide projectors, just sort of um, projecting the image through the geometry. It is not in any way going to adhere it to the old classic way of the according to the UVs. So here we are looking at the object's UVs, and it's got that kind of like, you know, picket fence at the top and the bottom, and sort of a, a, a basic grid in between. And it in no way is using any of the UVs. And that's what's unique about this because it's using the projection system. So now with this thing fitted, we want to come back in, uh, click on the shader one more time, follow it down its own little rabbit hole. We've already done fit to bounding box. We don't need to do that again. Uh, in fact, you can even see this when you bring up the outliner. You can physically see the place 3D texture node. That's what this is doing right here. <clears throat> so the next thing we want to do is come in and assign a physical image to it. And we've already done this. Come down here now to the image. Click on the checkerboard square. And it will ask you once again, well, what do you want to put onto this? This is where we now affix the image. We need a slide to project onto the sphere. The utility node was simply setting up that projection process. We still need to give it an image to project. And we don't see anything here. And you can get into a bit of a panic because you need a 2D texture. Click on this. I don't see anything here. That is because people tend to leave their search keywords up here and it's looking for anything with PROJ. We don't need this anymore. Get rid of it. The minute you get rid of anything up here, of course, it'll show you, as I said earlier, every single option. So clicking on 2D textures, all we want is a file. And now you have the image name option. Click on the folder and you can go into whatever folder you have. I'm going to read in a an image of kind of this, this pastiche of um, Images I've, I've cobbled together in Photoshop for a projection of the, the Sentinel from the X-Men mythology in Marvel. So if I open this thing up, it's got a very unique texture uh, assigned to it. And you can see it actually, once you press, again, 4, 5, and 6. You press 6, which is texture shading. You should see the projection go all the way through the sphere. Because again, it's meant to do it from one angle, the angle of this window here. So if you were to go into, say, the front view, let's just get our four views up again, go to the front view of Maya, you can see that it's actually accurately, albeit squished, projecting it onto uh, the sphere. So let's go and um, I want to explain the process first, and then I can explain how to correctly size these things. So if you, uh, with the two things selected here and I'm trying to compensate for my tiny little window. So you've got the sphere, you need to, you need to select both the object as well as the shader and I do this by uh, selecting the object. You can also do this in the modeling window and then shift selecting the shader. And I know that's my shader. In fact, I'm going to rename this to projection shader. Just has to be double plus sure. So I click on the object, shift, click on the shader, and now you can come up in the Hypershade window and convert this to a file texture Maya software. Go into the options because these are the options you're going to want to delineate given what it is you're looking to do. Are you looking to do um, a, uh, a JPEG, uh, a, a, a GIF, a GIF? Ooh, there's a war. What is it called? I don't care. Uh, you've got a JPEG, you've got a PNG. It really depends upon what it is, what format you're looking to convert it into. The other thing is the X and Y resolution. You need to delineate that. Now I'm going to leave this more or less on the, uh, the default. No, I'm not. That's way too small. 512 by 512, man. And let's choose JPEG again. So <clears throat> what I like to do is I like to have the fill texture seams because I don't want the uh, texture to be right at the edge once it's done converting. I want it to kind of fill out because it gets rid of those little weird seams when the uh, texture is done right to the edge. And this is something I can go over more when I'm, when I'm finished here. Um, I have set my, you know, 
project here in Maya. I've set the project to a particular folder, so I know where it's going to convert this image to. So you may want to check uh, where it is you've got your set project because that's where it's going to place this default converted shader and you don't want to go looking all over Kingdom Come for it when you're done. So at this point I've got the shader selected. Boom, yellow. I've got the geometry selected simultaneously and I come in here to convert file and I can click either convert and close or convert. And I'm just going to press convert and close. It's going to think about it and then it's going to save and what it's done is it's created a texture. And that texture now adheres to, as I mentioned earlier, the UV, the UVs. Remember when this was all blank? Well, this is now accurately um, projected onto the UV system. This is no longer using the projection texture. This does still exist in Maya. It is not being used. So uh, what it did is it automatically created a two-dimensional image, a 2D image, and it saved it. And if you're looking for the name of it so you know where to go, uh, gives you the name right here, Projection 1 Sphere, but uh, Projection Shader 1, it just kind of copied the name of what I gave the Projection Shader, and then it added a uh, version afterwards. So if you're looking for the Projection Shader, it's what you named. The conversion is usually the same name, 1, and if you click on this, sorry, if you click on this arrow here, you should be able to follow it all the way down to its uh, projection in the name. And I've already got a window open showing that space that I assigned my set project to right here. So I'm able to go in and just take a look at that image if I so desire. And so I can come in here and just double click on it and I can see the image. So this is half of it, of course, but it does show you the basic process of projecting something in Maya. Now what's crucial for this to work is that you need to have your UVs sorted out on this object. You cannot have a object whose UVs are an absolute mess because it doesn't work. It doesn't know how to assign those UVs. If you've got overlapping UVs one on top of the other, so that you're, you've are you got some sort of clever system of uh, utilizing one part of the projection onto both sides of the object, uh, you're asking Maya to do something in a very linear fashion and it can get confused. So this is the first part of the video where uh, the idea of what a projection is is explained. The projection shader, as I said, still does exist in Maya. It's just not being used. Uh, if we come up here to optimize scene size under file in Maya and clean this up, what it's going to do is it's going to get rid of that projection. However, one of the advantages, of course, is that if you reassign it projection and you're using Photoshop or some other uh, 2D manipulation software, you can actually assign not just the JPEG to this projection, you can assign a PSD file to it, which means you can have Maya open simultaneously and actually modifying the image that you're projecting onto your characters. So um, you can have this nice little loop where you are you have this projection onto your geometry and you open up Photoshop and you manipulate that so that it looks um, different. And you can just kind of go back and forth between the programs and fix things up so that they look the way you want them to. So um, what I want to do is I want to come in and mess with the, here we are. So Sentinel Front is what I originally used. And look, you've got this, you know, you've got all these crazy layers here, blah, 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 blah. And if I were to create a new layer here in the, uh, in this file and do something really nutty such as put a nice big ugly red streak put a nice big garish streak like so okay and then I save this as 
Sentinel Front PSD. And I come into Maya and I re reassign the image. Oops, let me break, drag this over. Do that again. Come in here to Maya and you reassign the projection. PSD. There you go, it updates. So you could have these two programs going simultaneously and just kind of dance between them. You know, dress this up, dress this up, dress this up, and then refresh your projection. Come in here and press return or whatever. And you should be able to see this update. So you've got this nice permanent um, connection so that you can modify the texture uh, in real time while you are still projecting it onto a 3D object. So that's the basic premise here of utilizing projections. And the next step is that I show you how to correctly size things. Okay, so let's move on to correctly sizing things so that this technique benefits us. Um, now we notice that the, one of the things that's not working right here, aside from this uh, big ugly swatch across the sentinel projection, is the fact that it is not correct uh, sized correctly. It is disproportionate to what it is we're looking at. Even from the front, which is how this is supposed to work, you can see this the sentinel image is sort of squashed to fit into the sphere. Well, uh, for the purposes of showing how this works, that that's fine. But what if you actually need the character to be sized correctly? That's an entirely different uh, problem. So if we are to use a uh, image manipulation program like uh, a paint program like Photoshop or uh, GIMP or whatever, what have you, you need to find out the proportions of what it is you're working in. So I can do that here using Photoshop by just bringing up what is the image size, but I can also do the same thing and get the same information by coming up and looking at the, um, the image that I'm using. If it's in a, I think I can do this even, yeah, in a PC, you can just right click on it and get information or sorry, uh, properties. And I think there's, well, I know there's a similar thing in, the Macintosh where you just get the information. So if you go to details, you can actually find the proportions. No, not with the Photoshop file, a little too elusive, fine. Save it as a JPEG, come in here, get the same thing with properties, and this should be a little nicer. And there we are. So the dimensions of the image are here, 390 by 623, and the same thing is here in Photoshop, 390, 6, 623. Okay, so we need those numbers when we're using this um, projection. And when we grab the projection itself, scaling in X is horizontal, scaling in Y is vertical, scaling in Z is inconsequential because this is a planar projection. So really you could type in scale Z1 and uh, it sort of pops to zero, 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 of course. You can move it out if that's, you still want it sort of in front of your object or in the middle, it really doesn't matter. But we do need the, the numbers that we brought up previously to uh, guide us with how we need to size this projection map. So 39623. So it's obviously horizontal favoring. Uh, it's kind of a, a portrait image where the longer side is going to be uh, vertical. So we'll take the 623 and put it into scale Y. All right gets starts looking a little silly there. Um, and the next we need to come up and use the 390 for X. So 390. There we are. All right, now the projection is sized correct correctly according to the dimensions of the image we're going to be using. The object, of course, is something we don't care that much about. <clears throat> because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this projection commensurate to the proportions of the image that we're using. So if you want to create a polygon primitive of something, say like a cylinder, go into your front projection and scale it up and just make it sort of fit the dimensions like so. And, and I'm not being exacting, obviously. I'm sort of just quickly putting, bish boshing this together just for the purposes of the demonstration of how this works. If you want to get into the fine-tuning 
of doing this for characters, please understand there's a different uh, process that's going to be further in the video that you can click to. But for the time being, I want to come in here and I want to bring up this projection map and apply it to the cylinder. Now what we have is this wonderful cylinder that actually has the Sentinel proportional. So no matter what object we project this onto, even if I were to create another uh, sphere and I could pull that behind and scale that up in some large way. Oh, look, it's a NURB sphere. Wrong thing to do. Create sphere. There we are. And we scale this all the way up and maybe move it behind the cylinder. Remember that the projection is going to be able to accommodate any number of geometries because it's just projecting through them. So even if I were to put that on a sphere and put that on a cylinder, it's just going from this projection and it's projecting it all the way through the geometry I assign it to. So this is the way that you want to make sure that your your projection volumes are sized correctly. So that is the basic way that you have to understand the relationship that Maya is uh, thinking about when it's thinking about the texture in relationship to the geometry. It's just projecting it. It does not adhere in any way to the UVs of either of these two geometries. It's just projecting it. You can even see here, although it looks like it's adhering to the UVs, it's ignoring the UVs because it's projecting all the way through and when you bake it you're going to start seeing these divots etc but for the time being both of these objects you just kind of click on them and see that the texture doesn't move it doesn't it doesn't get manipulated by the, the uvs in any way so that's the way to make sure that your projection works uh, as far as proportions the third part of this is taking everything you've learned in the first two parts and setting it up for characters slightly differently because we sized the texture correctly first Whereas to do it for a 3D model, you actually do it the other way around. So uh, now on to the third part that explains how to set this up for characters. Okay, so this is the final part of using projections. And uh, what happens usually is that someone gets a model first and foremost. They don't start with a texture map. So in this case, I want to bring in a very low poly model that was done for the purposes of. Um, kind of blocking things out, sort of a, a midway point between gray boxing and uh, having a final model. It's a very, very low poly model. And you can you can do this with a series of boxes. If I were to say read in um, a very low poly character. In fact, I encourage people to use this technique with very low poly characters because um, in this case, if I were just to read in uh, a bunch of boxes that approximate the character. I could, if I bake all these together, if I combine all these, under mesh, combine, then I've got something I can project the texture, the concept art of this character onto just fine. In fact, it might do a really good job, and that could be the next step of just seeing this character in the game, even though they're they're very blocky. It doesn't matter. Because this is a trick to project the texture onto anything. A very low poly gray boxed character or a, um, a much higher character. And even characters that are, that are meant to be in the game, it's a good first pass. So let's go back to reading in the character that I modeled, this, this uh, Sentinel character. And go through the steps one more time of creating uh, the projection texture for this character. Now... What you do when you want to set uh, something like this up is you, of course, create the Lambert and let's name this to, bring this in the window, name this to projection underscore shader. And I want to give it a nice big color. There you are. And pop it on, go back. Click on the checkerboard square, go down to Utilities. I'm going to scroll down, but again, if, if you have a different version of Maya, you can either scroll down and just look for Projection, or you can come up here and type in PRO. You'll get everything named with PRO, including Projection. And at this point, you want to verify that it is on your character in that sort of like black ochre color that it gives it, and come down here and click on Fit to B-Box. The minute it does this, it will size it. 
Do you need to use that fit to B box? No, you can actually grab this and size it yourself. But uh, it does a pretty good job doing it for me. And I rather like that because this is all I really care about. If we go to wireframe and click to the front, it looks like it kind of like uh, puts it exactly where I need it. Now, if I want to be really precise and I say, no, it's, it's cutting off a little bit here at the bottom, but I want to make sure that I've got it right there on the feet, you still have that chance. It's no worries. You can do that. No problem. But you do need this size to the character. So what I like to do at this point is to come in and although because I'm doing this tutorial with a very small window, um, what I like to do when I take a picture of the character, which is what I'm going to be doing using a screenshot, is that I maximize this to the size of my computer. And then I take a screenshot and I just go to my screenshot drive where I see all the images and I pull up the screenshot that I did with Maya. And what I do at this point is, and here it is, with a simple screenshot of the, of the front projection of the character, I want to sort of bake this down to uh, crop it down. And please understand that in this tutorial, I'm using a very deprecated screen size. I want to give the maximum amount of screen size to this uh, the best I can. In fact, I, I really want to do this correctly. I'm going to open this in Photoshop. Uh, the reason I want to open this in Photoshop is we get into a very, um, we get into an area of precision. And even if this thing is very low poly, very low um, image screen, I am providing the artist a uh, cropping to the exact projection frame in Maya for them to paint over so that this in turn can be the texture that I use to project on the character, all right? So if I if I do a sloppy job at this point, if I grab it and I say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab it kind of right here, out here, or in here, it's going to get artifacts when you project it. So I'm going to try to do as best the best job that I can and really get in there on a pixel by pixel level. Come in here, grab it right like so. Now I know it's exactly on the edge. And go over here to the far edge of this. Hopefully I can do this. This looks like it's going to be a real challenge with the updating. So I'm halfway through and there we are. Okay. So right there I have cropped the image. Yeah, crop it. Absolutely. So now we fit that on the screen. Great. So this is what you're going to be providing the artist for them to paint over. So I come in here and I want to save as, and I'm going to save it to the correct area. So here we are. I like to save it as a, I think JPEGs are very lossy. So I like to save it as a PNG file, but um, do yourself a favor and just save it something intelligible. In fact, you could say Sentinel front. I like to have sort of, uh, genus, species, phylum in my descriptions, uh, or what it is, and then the particular angle. So Sentinel front PNG, sure, go right ahead as a copy. Why not? So what I can do at this point is actually read in the texture to this, um, read in that PNG file that we've just done. So if I double click this, well, that doesn't help me much. So let's bring up the hypershade. Okay, so here we are. Uh, to click on this, you follow it down the little rabbit hole you gave it. Now, because we set up the projection, but we have not given it a file yet, an image file, we click on the checkerboard. We come in here to 2D textures, we see nothing, we freak out, we panic. No, we don't, because we come up here and we get rid of the PRO, which is under the keywords, and it shows us everything. So we want file, and then you click on the folder to find a particular image that you're looking for. And what you're looking for, of course, is Sentinel Front JP uh, PNG. Uh, you know, I should have named that. Th this It was remiss of me not to name this Sentinel Front Screenshot because I could have just as easily written over the image that I've painted by... Um, naming it the same thing. So something explicit. So here we are, reading in that image. There it is. 
And when we come in here to Maya, we press six to make sure that it goes to uh, texture shading. Uh, it looks terrible. And But what it's doing, and I'll do a quick render, is that it is, in case you want to up the resolution of what it is dis uh, you're displaying, you can come up to Renderer here and switch over to Viewpoint 2.0. should clean things up for you. So you can see that the uh, wireframe texture is actually being projected onto the character. It doesn't look that good, and that's because it is not adhering perfectly to the projection. Um, what it is doing is it's kind of stretching it ever so slightly, you know, across the body here. You see things sort of uh, misalign slightly as it gets closer. So if we were to do this 2.0. Uh, but it is close. It's pretty bloody close. And it allows you to see that there is a kind of one-to-one -one alignment of the texture, the screenshot that we took, versus what's on, what's on the body. And it also got these little gray lines in there. So overall, it's pretty good. And it shows you what you can do. And what that is, is you can actually use this uh, the screenshot that you've taken to bring it into a paint program like so. And this is what I did way early on. If I turn off all of these layers here, I turn off all of the layers that I added onto the top, you can see that what I started with was a screenshot. And what I did was I just came into the uh, internet and I found various bits and parts and I painted over it. Now, your artist may do a better job doing a custom painting over it, but the, the premise is the same. All I did was I filled this out using images of Sentinel toys that I found online to get me a very, get me very quickly to the point where I want it to be. So this is the projection for the front of the character, and I saved this out as a JPEG. So this JPEG here is Sentinel front. And if I come in here and the shader that I use is reassigned to is reassigned to use the color version that I've already painted over, then you can see suddenly what happens is boom, now we're talking. What I have is I've got a pretty good looking textured 3D model, at least from the front. So this will be a process where I bake it not just from the front, but also from the back. So uh, if you look at the UVs here, UV editor, you can see that it's it's the UVs are sorted. It's because it's a projection, it's not adhering to um, it's not adhering to the UVs yet, but the minute I bake it, it's going to split this all up. So let's see what this looks like when I do a projection and it uh, splits up the image into the UVs. So again, the process here is one where I grab the shader and then grab the model and have it baked out. So I grab the projection and I grab the model. In fact, it's better for me to verify that I've grabbed just that. Then I come up here to edit convert to texture map by a software. I've already, I'm going to use my previous settings and boom, it bakes it out. So now the projection is thrown onto these UV sets. And if I come in close, it looks pretty cool, at least a good beginning. And the back looks terrible because it's, again, it went all the way through the character. But I'm going to project once for the front of the character, and then I'm going to read in a different texture map so I can do it from the back. And then I'm going to take both of these baked texture maps and I'm going to read them into a paint program and I'm going to uh, combine the ones that are from the front in the proper area and the ones in the back of the proper area using alpha channels. So paint program knowledge is necessary to do this process, but it should be... Um, it should be fairly intuitive to understand that you project once in the front, you project another time in the back, 
and then you come into the paint program and you combine them and then you use that as your final map and it should look pretty good. So this technique is one that should allow you to get a uh, sort of a leg up and some quick projections onto gray boxed characters, onto medium characters, but I also want to show examples of how you can do it for uh, higher resolution characters. So let's say that you've got a, uh, a character that's actually um, pretty high res. Let me read in that character. I've got one that I'm working on, and this character has some Real definition to them. They're 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 a higher, they're kind of the final res model, really. There we are. And I've used a combination of front and back projections as well as a side projection, which is an alpha channel. It's pretty uh, numbingly complex to put together. I can't really recommend it as a, a as a as a way to uh, quickly get through anything. But you can sort of put all this stuff together. So let's take a look at this character. It's pretty, pretty complex fellow here, this little uh, kind of weird headless alien. And you can tell from the wireframe it's actually quite complex. Well, this is another advantage of using this technique when you make the characters, uh, because it is uh, irrespective of the complexity of your geometry. The projection will happen just the same. Remember those boxes of that little uh, skirted character that I brought in earlier? The projection is, uh, it doesn't care about the density of the geometry, so it can happen to high geometry characters and low geometry characters equally. So uh, we come in and take a look at, oh, look at that, Fatal Air. Imagine that, Maya. Um, if I come in here to the uh, Photoshop file of it, no, I don't care about. Oh, I look at that. I did the wrong thing. Um, you can see that I took a screenshot of this higher res character, and I did it not just from the back, but I did it from the front. And I've got them on different layers here because I can just paint over one of them and then project it and then paint over the other. And that's pretty much exactly what I did. So here is the basic color I wanted to use for the character, and that adheres to the uh, projection of the front. So I project this onto this character, and it suddenly inherits some basic color. So <clears throat> you need to do this for every... Um, you can actually set this up, this projection uh, up in Maya. Save that file out, and you can read in different geometries, like you've got it set up for a character made entirely out of blocks, and you do a projection on that. Save it in Maya, because the next time you can read in that file replace the geometry with a higher level of geometry, uh, higher detailed, more more um, uh, more denser geometry, more curved geometry, more, uh, more of a final character. And you can use the same projection technique. It is, it is not connected in any way to um, a particular mesh. It is not connected in any way to the, the density of the mesh. The one thing you need to have is you need to have the UVs sorted out. Because if the UVs are a mess, then uh, as you see, not only will it not work, but uh, Maya will crash. So that's fun, especially at 4.30 in the morning. So um, hopefully this technique gives you a, uh, a leg up in putting together your characters and understanding how the projections work, as well as um, combining the front and the back in a paint program so that you can get a, a, a basic texture going. All right, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Um, one of the things I wanted to give as kind of a parting shot is to those of you that are looking to see sort of a final product, um, this is something I've done here with this little character. And it's a higher level of geometry, but please also understand that as I mentioned earlier, the thing that's crucial about this is having the UVs sorted out. You cannot use this projection technique with any efficiency without laying out the UVs. And you need a trained character modeler to set out the UVs. You can't just uh, assume it's an automated process because it's not. It's an art form. No, no more automated than coding. No more automated than good art. 
it is an art form to set apart the UVs like so. The projection technique works, and it works basically to set something up so that you have a, um, a base texture. Do not set this up with any feeling like it's going to be a final texture because it's inherently flawed. You see this stretching here in the arm? Um, unless you set up a very complex system as I've done here, where there's a front projection, there's a back projection, and it's using an alpha channel here to blend between the two. Um, don't worry about how do I do that because it's an absolute mess to do it. If you're not, um, it's a real headache in my to start using things like uh, blended shaders. Uh, the point is that when you have something like this uh, projection from the front, all you need is the front art, like I, like I did here, and then the same projection for the back, and it'll give you this, uh, when you bake it once for the front, it'll give you a particular image. And then when you bake it for the back, it'll give you another particular image like so. It is up to the artist to know how to bring it into um, Photoshop or whatever other manipulation pro uh, image manipul manipulation program that you have, and bring them together. So here I have the front and then I put the back on the top and I've used an alpha channel to blend between the two. And this shouldn't take too long because um, you can actually hook this up as the texture that this character uses and start doing some modifications and painting over. Uh, but this is a way to get a basic texture going if these rules are met. The first one is you have to have someone that knows Maya. And you have to have someone that knows Photoshop. Um, this is not something where you can just learn it or can you just teach me. You have to come in with pre-existing knowledge about Maya and pre-existing knowledge about Photoshop. Um, and if you don't have that, get someone who does. Uh, this is a way to get a really fast beginning texture. This is the texture I got from combining these characters. God, no, it's not. That's awful. That's bloody awful. This is the carrot. This is the texture that I got from combining the two, and it's a good place to start. But after that, I just handed this over um, uh, to the texture artist that I was working with and had them just work on the texture from here on out by hand. So it's a good way to get a ground, um, sort of a base texture for that character that someone can then expand upon. It gets a lot harder when your characters are in pieces. It gets a lot harder if the characters are not uh, do not have their UV uh, sets done correctly. It gets very hard if things are simply not organized. So make sure that you've got someone who's trained in Maya who's setting this stuff up and knows kind of a pipeline process because this is this is only one process in many that need organization and clarity and sorting out and a clear hierarchy. Otherwise, you're going to have dozens of textures all over the place and you're going to have confused people and, and people panicking at the last minute saying it didn't do it. What is wrong? And it's, it's just too vague a question to, to answer. So just make sure that you have a very clear organized folder structure where things are and where your meshes are, where your projections are, where your Photoshop files are. Everything for me is in the same file. That's the way I put it here for the projections. And it's not a way to get a final texture. It's a way to get a beginning texture so that you can hand it over to the texture artist to then do by to to then smooth and um, and and add to by hand. So it shouldn't be a technique that you go back to repeatedly. Uh, it can be for the same mesh. Like I wouldn't use projections to make a final texture on this character. I would do it just to get a, a to get going with a basic texture, and then I would do the rest by hand. Uh, and I could read in a smaller character and just put it in here. That's fine. But just understand that this is a technique that does not exist in an automated way, or it doesn't exist as uh, something that you can read in any model, and uh, it should work. You need to sort out the UVs. You need to sort out where you've saved your project, and just make sure that you're very clear on all the steps in the tutorial, because missing one um, is, is sure to mean certain death. Anyway, have a good night.